is to be within Christ. See, when a person is within Christ, those beginning steps, things do change in the person when they're in Christ. And it's a process, right? Upon reflection, all those we care about coming to Christ, we actually see ourselves in them. And that's why our hearts pour out. That's what I wanted to address. See, we were in that process by ourselves. We, many of you were. Many of us old and dusty ones certainly were. Right? We were in that process of finding Christ by ourselves. We had advice all around us, but we were by ourselves, as though no one really spoke our language. Right? They didn't understand our situation. And so we couldn't uh, take everything from them. We heard the advice, but we couldn't take everything in. Right? Because they didn't understand our situation. Well, when you look at a person, a family member, a sister, brother, somebody like that, and it's that same exact thing where you do actually feel that uh, a person does not understand, right? They feel the same thing. They will desire to talk to you, but you don't understand. So it's something in the minds of many folks that will make them think nobody understands. We thought the same thing. And so when you see someone in one of those situations, automatically your heart pours out. Because you know they can find peace, rest. Right? In fact, finding rest is finding Christ. It really is. Right? The Lord of the Sabbath, which is to say the Lord of rest, is finding that rest. And which is why, which is why repentance will always follow someone who needs it. Always following them. Now, for a long time, even for those people you can't seem to reach yourselves, repentance is following them. It always follows them. Right? In the book of John, it says that Jesus is that light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. So he is that truth, that light, that essence behind all of us, that lights all of us as we come into the world. Then we know repentance follows every single person on the face of this earth. Who needs it? Right? Who needs it? And we needed repentance too. And it followed us. Right? And the Lord, here's what the Lord did. He's so marvelous in what he does. Now, it took a long time for some of us to come to our senses, didn't it? It really did. As, as pure and simple, it took, took a long time. Right? Because we go through stages. At first, we think, yes, I am there, and we find out we're not. There's something more that must be done. Something else we have to give up. Something of that nature. And then we find him again. We say, yes, I'm finally there. And all of a sudden, something else is exposed. So then why weren't we destroyed? I'll tell you why. The anointing of the Father, his pity is what is the providence of mercy itself. His pity upon us. Just as if you would pity an infant who's trying to take steps. Pity is not some sorrowful thing either. It is, in fact, a very gracious heart to give one space to accomplish though they may stumble many times. Right? So then, the Father's pity being perfect is actually an anointing. Because if we, did, we weren't anointed in that way, we would have struck out a long time ago. The process would be interrupted. We have to have mercy and grace to finish the process. That's what mercy and grace is for. It is space, it is room, it is understanding, long-suffering to complete the process. Right? We all must understand that. So, when Mayor said that, it kind of triggered some things within me. Lord knows I've been through a lot of processes. Right? The one with the greatest heart towards somebody else is the one who messed up the most. That's a fact. When you have messed up things on a very deep level, and I'm not a shallow thinker, so to speak, and that's what got me in trouble in the first place. When you think deep, and you go to find all these marvelous solutions for somebody else, you find out you have no solutions for yourself. Because everything you discover, right, everything you discover, you've actually, what internally is something you need to overcome. Right? So then repentance following a person. That will happen. That, that is Christ going to get the one sheep who went astray. Right? But for some of us who have messed up the most, we understand a lot of situations. Therefore, we are very, very understanding of other people's situations. Right? The person who never condemns is the person who did the same act the other person's doing. 
A person who has been addicted to alcohol understands the fight of alcoholism and to get off alcohol. Therefore, they're not going to condemn somebody who's an alcoholic. Well, it just so happens that I've been thrust in so many situations of my own doing that I understand quite a few things. I'm never ready to condemn anybody of anything because I would rather fight for them. I understand the fight. I understand it's difficult. It's hard. Right? There are weak points and strong points. There are times you think you've made it through and you didn't. I understand those things. So then a person of that type understanding, they've actually, they've actually been there. I mean, they have messed up the most royally. See, and you guys think that the, just like one of the greatest speakers that people accept as one of the greatest speakers is Paul. Well, Paul did the worst things out of all the uh, apostles. I mean, he did the worst of the worst. But this guy sat in the house of Caesar. So he couldn't have been that good, believing in other things, enforcing laws that would kill people, uh, you know, indulging in alcohol and all this other stuff. As is customary, they did other rituals, things you wouldn't believe. But when you come to Christ, a process of dying to the flesh begins. If it is done wholeheartedly, right, then the process is pure. If it's done half-heartedly, you're still going through the process, you're going to be spanked a bit. But the person who goes through these things, they understand the struggle of another. And they're never ready to condemn. In fact, a person who would just outright condemn another person of what they're struggling with has done so in great error. Great error. And I'm not one of those folks who likes goody two-shoed people either. Because they deny the truth. All of us are born into sin because we occupy in the flesh. All of us do. But when Mayor said that, it reveals something within all of us. We have a heart for someone to be safe in the bosom of the Father. And because of that heart, you'll never turn your back on somebody. Because it'll always be on your heart. That's called a burden of love. That's a debt of love. From the heart that you really can't shake from your heart. It's always going to be there. But in doing so, understand this. Every situation a person has been in, they had to be in. That's something most Christians don't understand. Whether you did it or somebody else did it, if it's necessary for your life, it's coming to you. God deemed it so. Most people forget that God is God. And that if something is never permitted to happen or allowed to happen, it's just simply not going to happen. You've not been through a situation that wasn't permitted to happen. Yes, your faith, in, in order for you to emerge your spiritual self to emerge, right? That new creature to emerge. The old creature had to be destroyed. Now, each old creature has different soft spots, right? Or let's call them lethal points. And those points have to be just utterly stabbed to death to kill it because the old man is quite strong. It desires to hang on to you everywhere you go. Because the old man are the things of the old man are those things you have beheld with your eyes. It's hard to just prove them, right? The spiritual things you have not seen. And that's what you're becoming. Something you have not seen. Something you don't know about. Something unclear. Something that is only confirmed internally, but something you have never seen. That is an impossible task. Nevertheless, the Lord places us in this world, and he's doing just that. You are becoming the impossible the unimaginable and the old man is being destroyed in the process of doing so you thought it was unfair in your life and you walk around sometimes with wounds and thoughts of wounds and all this that and the other you had to go through those things or you would not have gone through them and because you did go through them it exposed something of your flesh but it also did something quite genuine it caused you to have compassion upon those who are going through the same process. That's why it's so very important that you, be, that you be free from those things you've gone through because there are others you must help who are going through that same circumstance. And if you give up, they get no help from you. Your life is tied to everybody you've been sent to and you don't even know it. 
your life is. You're the representative called before they, so you must go and assist them. But if you don't break free according to the word of God, how can you help them? This is a task before all of us. Part of the redemption process. Right? Discipleship, if you will. Or to be one of the many members in the body of Christ doing specific duties. But you must become that you may be of assistance to those who you have been sent to. And yes, the Lord has sent you to many people. Don't beat yourself up because you think you messed it up. You really think the Lord would allow you to go to somebody to kill him? All things are purposed. Some people don't believe that, do you? Let me give you a... I'm gonna, all things are purposed. All things. And sometimes you don't quite understand what in the world things are for, do you? You don't understand why you had to hurt and all this, that, and the other. I'm going to tell you a story about a parasite. Can I do that? It's a real parasite. There's a parasite, right, that grows in snails. Right? Grows in snails. The process of the parasite, you wouldn't believe all the components involved. Because that parasite being so small, that is actually, it, it, it is hatched inside of a snail, knows nothing of where it came from. Well, let's talk about where it came from. Here's the process. The eggs hatch, or those little critters hatch inside of the snail and take it over. All of a sudden, in the water where the snail was, they begin to, you know, kind of just go up, go up, go up, and guess what they're searching for? Tadpoles. So they go into the hind legs of the tadpole, and they do something very weird. As the tadpole is growing in the hind legs, it causes a deformation, causes the frog to grow an extra leg. They do it every single time. So if you ever see a frog with three legs instead of two, it likely has one of those parasites. Most people don't even know this. So then that frog has three legs and not two. But why would the parasite do something like that? And they purposely do this. But why? I'll tell you why. So it can't get away. So it can evade predators that will eat the frog. Like a bird. Right? A bird. So when a bird eats the frog, the parasite, right, then goes into the stomach of the bird where the acids of the bird cause a fertile ground for all of them. They become an adult. They utilize the acids to reach maturity. And then they all meet up in the stomach of a bird. Well, you know what the bird does. The bird's flying around. The bird is oblivious to this. And the bird poos. Where's the bird poo at? next to the water again and if it happens to poo near a pond right then the eggs go right back into the snail and the process starts all over again all over again but there's something else about the parasite they keep the number of snails down and they also control the number of frogs so that frogs don't overcome everything and that the snails don't overcome everything because those two creatures are pretty hard creatures, right? It also makes the prey available to birds and so on and so forth, right? But if you happen to look at a frog with three legs, you'd say, oh, poor creature, because you don't understand the process. Now, you can't personify a frog as though it's some, you know, individual who needs mercy, all life is made to support life in a way in which God has designed it. All too often we look at life oblivious to the smallest things that take place. And we do ourselves the same way. We really do think that some unfortunate thing has happened to us and we forget so fast God is in control that the whole thing is by design. That is not evolution. That parasite, how it multiplies, it is genetically implanted. They have the power to change the DNA of a frog. That it grows two hind legs, they can alter the instructions, and it's always an extra leg, an extra limb, so it can't hop away. Hmm. So it's a process. It's, it's part of a design. Do you know how many people in the world do not accept what they went through even right now? They're not healed from it because they don't accept it was purposed. They say to themselves, oh, why would God send me through this turmoil? Even that frog has no idea. He's helping to sustain us. 
frogs are intimate to life of humans. And most people can't make that connection either, so are snails. Most people can't make that connection either, so are parasites. Most people can't make that connection either. An imbalance in one of them could really break down multiple things. Because they don't know the purpose. Even science, they go back to try and find the purposes of all these things. That's how they're found. Years and years of study. Right? To determine what? Here's what they determine each and every time God has truly designed a paradise. And it's in the smallest things. It's not paradise to most of you because of your brothers and your sisters who are also going through a process. Amazing, isn't it? It's an amazing thing. Now, but if you walk in this world not being healed of the wounds of the things you thought were unfair, because here's a fact. You think they're wounds, right? They're not. They're not wounds. It's purposed. It altered you. It kept you away from things. See, you have no appreciation of it because to you it's unfair. Nobody else had to go through it like you did. You know, some people went through it, but everybody didn't. But if everybody went through it, it would then be normal. Isn't that funny? Honestly, if it, no matter how horrendous it is, if everybody went through it, all of a sudden it's normal because everybody else does it. But when it happens to you and you're isolated, it's not normal. But that's the whole key. It didn't happen to everybody. It happened to you because you're the one to undergo the process so that you may speak to the ones who will come after. Because those folks, consequently, belong to the Father. You know what their origin is? God. Never question the origins of a person, because you don't own them. And if they came from your Father, and you defame them like they came from somewhere else, you're going to, have, you're going to find you're fighting against what the Father has set in motion. And Lord, help your soul on that because you'll suffer many days. Everything you do will seem to be cursed. You'll say, well, why is this bad stuff happening to me? And it's almost like the Lord will speak softly and say, well, you keep condemning what I do. You condemn my work. If you condemn my work, you're still going to live. But how can you have a blessing? Right? 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 So all things are purpose. That's the first thing you need to A person has to undergo what is meant for them. Now, you should know you can't stop that process, right? Because they don't belong to you. You just happen to see it. The question is, why and how do you see it? How in the world did you recognize that of all the people that are in your life, how do you see it? How do you see it? Why are you drawn to it? I'll tell you why. Because you're one of the elements. See, somebody in your life said something to you, and it changed the course of your life, didn't it? Out of everybody here in the chat room, each one of you knows someone who told you something that stayed with you all your life. Each one of you knows someone like that. And when they said it, You didn't even acknowledge it. It wasn't a wow moment until many years after. See, only after many years was it a wow moment. Like, yes, they were right. And it really changes you. One person can speak some encouragement into you that will last for a lifetime. Well, guess what? You're that person. You are that person. See, you're not here to fix anybody's life. You're here to carry the word. You're here to be the word. Right? A lot of people say, well, I want to do the Father's will. What is the Father's will? It is the words he spoke. And if your heart didn't break for them, you would give up on them. But when your heart breaks, guess what? You keep going back, don't you? No matter what they say, you keep going back, and 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 you're asking people, well, what must I do? This is breaking my heart, and that's the reason why you're still looking. You're still watching. You're still interceding, because you may not know this. While you're telling them one thing, your heart is crying out to the Father. And when your heart cries out to the Father on behalf of somebody else, that's precisely why you were sent here in the first place. 
So you're fulfilling the will of God by way of the heart. You just have not comprehended that yet. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is called servitude. A process. You didn't even know it. Hmm. It's an amazing thing. It really is an amazing. There are certain people in your life that are like uh, ticks and they won't go away. And they aggravate and annoy you. But guess what? They were sent to you. You know what they do? They make you straighten up. They expose gaps and areas in yourself that you need to close up. They expose weak points. Right? They're tapping on your armor to find weak points. They annoy you to pieces. You love them, but you can't stand to be around them. Do you know why? Because they always find a weak point in your armor. Even those people are there on purpose, and you don't even know it. Because see, where there's no more weakness, there's no more activity of the flesh in response to them. There's only truth. Here's the process. I'm going to give you this. Once that happens to you, they're going to hear you for the first time. The same one that always finds your weak points is the same one that when you're fully covered they're going to receive of you words of life of all people they're going to get them from you the same ones that denied everything you said they will receive them of you but they're sent your life to probe you see the father does not do evil or anything else right but all things on this earth are purposed there's nothing purposeless or it couldn't exist. The reason why people exist so long is because we have choices. We can have purpose. The question is, will we or will we not? Okay. But they're probing you. Some of you should find that funny now because they'll come up to you and say the exact phrases that expose a weakness within you. Okay. The moment... Truth fills those weak areas, which are flesh. What they say does not disturb you. And then you begin to speak life into them. To you, they speak words of death. To you, they speak threats and all sorts of things. They do that because it exposes weak points. Now, they couldn't be there unless it was part of your process. Do you think when you're building a house, if wood had feelings, do you really think the wood would be okay with the building of a house, no matter what it was for? I don't think so. I don't think so. Do you really think metal, when it's being fashioned into something, just simply would agree with whoever's fashioning it? I don't think so. Do you think a pot would really enjoy the potter smashing and squeezing it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Nor do we really like the molding and twisting, stretching, cooking that we go through either. Right? It's because we don't know the end result yet. We speak of it, but we have not seen it. So we don't know. And if you saw it, you'd rush to get to it. So you can't see it. You have to live through it. You have to live through the word of God that you too be true to read it is one thing isn't it totally different to walk it out you try to walk out the word of God in your life it's going to expose every weak point you ever thought you had there be stuff you had you didn't think you had you would say to yourself where did that come from when you respond to somebody out of frustration you'll say oh my lord did I really just say that what is wrong with me all right, you'll go into a corner, and, oh, I'm not fit for the kingdom or anything else. Just destroy me, right? But, of course, God does not. Because you're being fashioned and molded into what? Into what, though? What are you becoming? You're becoming a vessel that may be filled and sealed, that nothing leaks out ever again. And what you hold, everyone will need, but it will be yours. 
this all all these things are a process, right? It's probably why I'm partial. I'm I'm really partial to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the walks of the apostles, and and the walks of the prophets, especially Elijah. I often go back and revisit his story, because they were total different people than what we are today. You have to imagine not being distracted by, you know, you guys will reach absolute boredom. If you didn't have computers, no one to contact, all this. If you did things back the way they did it back then, you'd go crazy. It would expose that what you want, you want right away. Hmm. I marvel at it. Therefore, because people can't see the process What's the first thing you want to do? You want to get away from this world as fast as you can. Not knowing that this world is the world to come. You just can't see it. What if the Lord told you, right? You have to think of something. The mindset you have right now, is it really a godly mindset? Is it? Is it really a godly mindset? Are you really disgusted with this world? And if so, why are you disgusted? Isn't it the people in the world that cause you to be disgusted? Or is it your lack? Is it because you can't have what you want? See, there are only two things here, folks. Listen, it's either because of the people or because you don't have what you want. If you had everything you wanted, you wouldn't struggle. If you had what you needed, you wouldn't have sleepless nights. But when you have everything you need, people come into your life and disrupt it, don't they? And when people are not in your life to disrupt it, you don't have what you need, do you? What you think you need, do you? Don't you find that strange? Hmm? If you gain one thing, you lose another. Why? Why? If you have money, you have no relationship. You have relationship, you have no money. If you have money and relationship, you've had, you have issues somewhere else. Something I figured out a long time ago. Listen to me. There's always going to be something to continue your growth. No matter what you try to get rid of, there will always be something else. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because you are a spiritual, eternal individual. Spiritual and eternal. And some of us, some of us, we have a lot within us that has to be chopped up and chopped off to get rid of. The same thing we try to keep turns out to be the same thing that's destroying us. That's killing our souls. So I ask you this. Which one are you, honestly? Because if you're a person of flesh. You do mind the things of the flesh, and flesh is nothing more than tangible things, things of the world, the acceptance of what you see, how you walk, and all these other things. That is the world of flesh. The world of the spirit can always overrun the flesh. In fact, it commands the flesh. Just like this, if your soul is healed, your flesh will follow. If your soul is broken, brokenness will be upon your flesh. How many who are sick have sorrow in the heart? How many? You've got to ask yourself, how many? How many? Sorrow in the soul, right? Is the birthplace of what you really are. The inside has to be fixed. And understanding a process gives you confidence in what the Father is doing. 
Now I have to tell you who you are too. How was a person ever, how was a person guilty? Mayor, did that answer that for you, sis? Because Mayor began this. Now somebody else posted a picture. Whose picture was that? I'm watching the chat room, guys. Oh, and by the way, you know, I've seen abuses before like that. I've seen that. I've seen some awful things of what folks can do. But see, we're at the point now where we can, we can see what the Lord is doing if we want to. Right? Now, I have to tell you who you are. Might want to buckle up on this one. I say this, I'm, I'm going to put this in a simple way, Holy Spirit, help me. And believe me, it's not for me. It's not for edification, it's not for, you'll find out, it's not for anything but to understand something. How will those who stayed in their flesh be pronounced guilty? How is a person in the end going to be pronounced guilty by God? Can anybody answer that? Anybody? If you take the average person, right, how are they going to be pronounced guilty? How? If I go out there and chop down some trees, is that going to make me guilty of anything? What? How are we going to be guilty? Dr. V says, deny the word. Okay. Now, to apply the word, how do we do that? It takes people, doesn't it? To apply the word of God takes your fellow man, correct? To love your neighbor as yourself, you actually have to have a neighbor, right? Could I deny the word of God if there were no human life? on this earth according to the gospel of Jesus Christ I couldn't do anything well I mean what could I do to anybody nothing could I sin against my brother or my sister in the end Jesus will look at people and say depart from me you worker of iniquity I never knew you so you have to be a worker of iniquity Right? Pastor Scott says, deny Christ. That's right. So Dr. V and, and Pastor Scott, both are saying, deny Christ. God is the, or, or Christ is the word made flesh. So both of them are saying the right thing. So how do you deny Christ? First of all, if you deny Christ, you've denied what he said. That means you don't believe in what he said. And you're doing something else. Right? Is that fair to say? Jesus is the word made flesh and dwelt among men. So to deny Christ, you're denying his word. You're saying, no, he's not my salvation in this area. Uh Uh-oh. No, he's not my priest in this area. No, no, no. I'm my own savior here. No, he's not this, that, and the other in this area. Right? Isn't that right? But listen. How can you go the opposite? How can you deny Christ, which is to deny the word without your brother and your sister? When the word contains everything we do unto each other. First element. You ready for this? Your neighbor is your task. Uh Uh-oh. And your neighbor is everybody but you. Your neighbor is your task. Your neighbor is. Your fellow man is your task. Your fellow man is the will of God in your life. Your fellow man is. Do you know how many spirits have come in to the body of Christ, right, that have said, no, no, no. In fact, most people don't believe that, that their fellow man is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen. Jesus says, these things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended, that they shall put you, listen, they shall put you out of the synagogue, Jay, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that they doeth God of service. And these, why would they put you out of the synagogue? Because you're speaking the will of God or the words of Christ into people. You can't do the will of God absent your neighbor. Let's continue. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. Speaking in the synagogue, say, what's the big deal? So just don't go into a synagogue, and they won't throw you out, right? Wrong. What is a synagogue? What is that? 
let's call it this. Wouldn't a synagogue be a platform of which the word is spoken? Like your mouth. When you speak the word, are you not chastised by other folks? Don't they try and throw you off the subject? Oh, we don't want to hear that. That's what you think about God, not me. Don't they do that all the time? They don't want to hear what you have to say about Christ. Because you're speaking to your neighbor, right? Right? So a synagogue really can be anywhere the word is spoken. But everywhere you speak the word, nobody wants to hear it. Well, your family members will certainly sometimes shun you for doing that, right? Won't they do that? Huh. You will. And why is that? Because of the word and how it is. Even the Holy Ghost was sent to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Right? To believe upon the name of Christ is to believe what the name stands for. Messiah, Savior. The words are salvation unto your soul. Do you believe that the words are salvation unto your soul? Many do not. Do you know how many people read the gospel of Jesus Christ and they'll sit there and say, well, that won't work for me. So they don't believe the words of salvation unto their soul. They don't believe that. Which means that's why they don't follow the way of Christ. Isn't that denying Christ? Hmm? We're going through a process. Don't scare yourselves. We're going through a process. And the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth, correct? Right? John 16, 13. Now be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, Jesus says. For he shall receive of mine. He shall receive of mine. What does that mean? He will receive... Of mine. All things handed over to the Son, authorities included. The Holy Spirit will speak the truth of the entire situation. Always in Christ. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show unto show it unto you. He shall take of mine and show it unto you. So the entire mind of Christ, the Holy Spirit will convey to you. That's powerful. Forget the other stuff. That's enough for me. There's nothing more precious to me than, than to know the absolute will of God that I may walk in it. To do the will of God is upon your neighbor. Because the will of God is that none of us perish outside of him. Now we're getting somewhere. Your neighbor is the will of God. So then how are people going to be pronounced guilty? You ready? It's coming. It's coming. Let me take a sip of this uh, juice here. How are they going to be pronounced guilty? Hmm? How? I'll tell you why. You ready? There's some of you here. You don't have a spirit that fights a person back don't have it you don't have it there's some of you here who have gone through many things because you don't have a spirit that fights a person back it's not in you to do so in fact even the idea of conflict is confusion to you you relent don't you you relent and you end up allowing a situation that forms in your life but you can't find yourself to come to the point of fighting back. Let me explain a true situation to you, ladies and gentlemen. Something that will change your life if you can understand it. There are other vessels who come against other vessels. The vessels they normally come against are those who have no will to fight back because they were purposed that way. The vessels who damage a vessel who doesn't fight back is going to be guilty for what they did to that vessel. I knew a young lady once, and since her birth, I know some now, and since her birth, they were sexually abused, taken advantage of, abused and run over, 
right? Beaten in later relationships by their husbands, and they never had that, that type of spirit to fight back. And I often looked into those situations, having spoken to many of them. And I asked, I said, Lord, I, I know you purpose all things, but why this? Why this? And here's what is revealed. I'll summarize. You know when everybody says when you die and all these things are going to be played back in front of your face? That person that has targeted one of God's purpose vessels that was purposed to be targeted is guilty because of what they did to that vessel. They took advantage of one who never had the spirit of fighting. The truth of them exposed, going all the way in what they did, that's being very close to a type of condemnation. But they're striking vessels who don't have that spirit of fight within them. Right? I'm not talking about a person being struck that will just throw a hammer at you if you do that. That's not what I'm talking about. There are certain ladies and certain gentlemen who will not harm another human being. They may get angry but they will not harm another human being. They will not fight a person back. They will almost freeze like a deer in headlamps. And they will become sorrowful, taking the pain, but sorrowful in heart, forgiving the one that struck them, but sorrowful in heart. Let me tell you who you are. You're the one that's being struck by another. And you are the one they will see again. You're the one that's causing them to be guilty every time they strike you. Because you're the vessel that the Lord has bestowed upon you something very special internally inside of you. Which is why you keep going back to him. But that person and those people are going to be guilty. Because they chose to strike the innocent. whether physically or verbally. It doesn't matter. Because you're a vessel of usage, that means usage for the will of God. How many times have you heard an unfair deed happen to people out there in the world? You don't go through it, but you say, that's a shame. They should be punished for doing something like that to, to people like that. Or you're that one. Why do you think God is giving you strength to get over the pain, but to really meditate and contemplate and see that person internally. Because you're the last call for their life, and you don't even know it. You are the one before it's all over for them, and you don't even know it. And you won't even share, and you can't share what you actually feel inside. It's a love you don't understand yourselves. I can tell you this too. It is within your freedom. Because people do that. You can walk any direction you want to. But sometimes. Sometimes. I'm not talking about the, the, the... I'm talking about you who belong to Christ. You're the vessel that's making them guilty. Because what they have done unto you, they have done unto Christ. Because you believe in Christ, you're a partaker with him. When they strike you, they're beating Christ again. The Lord said, what you have done unto the least of these, you've also done unto me. Whether you do that verbally or not. Now that person, when you stand there, and you know what they did to you, you need to start seeing right. And it is this. It's their last chance. You cry for their souls. And it's their last chance, which is why you're crying from your soul to theirs.
You know what, though, when you know, and the Lord will take the reins of your situation. But when you know somebody has a last chance before they're fully given over to a reprobate mind to be doomed, you won't sit there and perpetuate a falsehood. Nor will you believe a lie again. I have some advice for you, all those who are undergoing attacks from your spouses or boyfriends or anybody else. Do something for me. You pray to your Father in heaven. But he give you the mind of truth that you may speak the truth no matter what the situation is. Never comfort an issue like that. Your heart is toward the person. But I'm telling you, it's a last cry. People have no idea what time, what season they have entered into. There have been relationships in the past where people beat each other. Husband and wife going at it, arguing, fussing, fighting. That's one thing. That's not what I'm speaking of. But when one is backed into a corner and they cry out to the Lord, I'm telling you, the Lord heard you the first time. He's not hard of hearing. He heard you the first time. But understand the sentence that's surely about to come. Because the season has changed. And some people are going to find themselves with no assistance from on high. And that's going to be a very bad day for all those who struck these vessels of great love in the earth. And you won't have that physical form in that way. Nor will you ever see a day of darkness again when that time comes. Because you live through a type of torment all your life, there's no need for you to live through further torment. Your great tribulation has been your life. And even the Lord said, if that is so, and yes, he said these things in Scripture. Those who have lived their tribulation in life and have grown from it and sought him even the more, Guess what? Their time, their season, their passage of temptation is over. Jesus only spent 40 days in the wilderness. Not 80. Once you overcome something, there's no need for that anymore. It was purposed a specific season. That you be shown who you truly are. those who live in the tribulation now just as Jesus said those who cry now well they're going to laugh with joy but those who laugh now are going to cry later mourn those who have lived through these turbulent times now in this lifetime no need for you to go through the other if you're with the Lord Jesus Christ those who went through a tribulation and have turned away from Christ they have to go through it all the way. But all those who are being sh struck like that, you better know the truth of the situation. Never edify yourself as though you didn't do anything wrong, but understand something. You're a vessel of usage, and the Father heard your heart the first time. In fact, it is your heart he is attuned to. And that person who's doing it, you're their last cry. They wouldn't listen to anything else. When you do violence to another person, I'm telling you something. You, that person, though their hearts may desire to do the right thing, is battling with something. How many of you think, do you really think God will make a mistake? Do you think God will make a mistake? Anybody? I don't. I don't think he will ever make a mistake because he can't. Therefore, all situations that belong in our lives, because you don't even know where you're from. You didn't know you were a vessel in this world that's causing many to be guilty. So that when somebody's mouth opens towards you and you've said nothing to them, they're the ones being pronounced guilty for their vileness upon you. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. 
Now do you understand? I will repay, saith the Lord. Now do you understand? If he said that to hold your peace, then he heard you the first time. Do you understand? Whenever you get totally tired of a situation, which here's the thing for you Christian folk who are in these abusive situations. Some of you don't want out. You want the other person saved. You know what you're doing? You're laying down your life for the sake of another. That's what you're doing. Does that mean stay in a situation where somebody is killing you to pieces? No, that's not what it means. You'd be led by the Spirit. Intervention is on your behalf. But I tell you, when the Lord intervenes personally, well, it is something else. But he heard you the first time. In fact, he's with you closer than with most. Because your heart cries out more than most. Ladies and gentlemen, these seasons have totally changed. Have you noticed that there's an uncontrollable urge in folks to do and say anything now? Hmm? This is their wickedness and iniquity is flourishing in the earth. Wickedness and iniquity flourished in Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Wickedness and iniquity flourished in the earth prior to the flood. And what happened to the earth? We all know it flooded. That's where the fossils came from. Let's not be fooled. It takes great pressure to cause fossils. Now, all the dinosaurs seem to have died under that great pressure. That is, you know, I can't get into that. Because a lot of these, uh, you know, folks who believe in geology, somebody else's uh, say so about uh, time stamping how old something is is kind of foolishness to me but anyway to me because I believe in the word of God I know that the Nephilim and the offspring of the Nephilim were in many different forms they were not all human they have the bones in museums what if a T-Rex was a Nephilim what if a raptor was a Nephilim what if all those big birds and everything else they were Nephilim they had to be wiped away and then people say, well, evolution had it. No, there were mammals mingled in with him. Modern day humans mingled in with those bones. Why didn't they put those on display? The same deer that walks around today walked around with the dinosaurs. Why not put them on display? You see, it didn't make sense. But all the big stuff was wiped out. How come the elephants weren't wiped out? They're pretty big. There's certain things don't make sense. My goodness, I can't get into that, folks. I'm going to take a break real quick, and I'll be right back. Okay, now there we are. You guys know I was talking and I was asking, could you guys hear me and nothing. So we answered Mayor's question. I'm sorry. You, uh, hopefully everybody feels better. Yeah, but I shouldn't get into subjects of, uh, concerning anything dealing with evolution. Of course, I get a little passionate about that. I want you guys to know that, uh, this, this, uh, you better watch France now. Boy, they really think they have a good thing. Well, we can always hope the best for them, right? They have their uh, new elected, their president elect. His first name is Emmanuel. You guys know that? Anyway, this guy is, well, it's befitting. This, this end time paradigm that we have certainly, certainly befitting this end time paradigm. Also, guys, I want you guys to pray for something specifically and keep this on your minds. North Korea uh, is, is, is really, and they're, they're really uh, doing the undoable, the unthinkable. And so is China. China is now, I don't know if you've noticed, but they're making demands upon the U.S. on who to keep and who to get rid of in order for them to fulfill their uh, portion of national defense, shall we say, concerning North Korea. North Korea is now taking U.S. personnel, and they are detaining them. They're going all throughout North Korea, and, and all those Americans in North Korea 
are in danger. They really are in danger right now. So, well, that, that is, um, that's just not good. They're in danger. Right, they are. There was a rumor of sorts and some sayings, and, and their people are stirred up in North Korea right now, saying that the U.S. wants to kill their leader, and so some of the loyalists in that country are now backing or are going to detain American personnel. American personnel. And um, that's just not a good situation. I can only imagine uh, their horror or terror. And, of course, they're not going to give a, you know, the, this is collateral of the worst kind. But we, we live in the world now where, you know, all things are, it's just a very unfortunate situation. And it's going to increase. And now no one is certain if Russia will, in fact, assist the U.S. in its um, helping of certain things in that province, that region. Okay. Well, and there we are. But those, uh, I, my heart goes out to anybody who would ever be held captive by another nation. But it's becoming uh, quite, quite revealing. Also, we do, we, you know, you guys have to be careful not to get too excited about the times we live in, given the news that you're about to hear, the, the, um, uh, all the movements and, and associations that are changing, but... We are, um, or we're entering into a, a very stretching time, I guess you could say. Very stretching time. And Christians, we really have to be Christ like. Fully adopting His Word, putting it into practice, living it each and every day, and be careful not to sink back into the one that you were yesterday, right? Today is that day for us to truly become what we are. Today is that day. Having said that, prayers are necessary. There are so many people in so many different provinces, and they can go wrong so quick. So quick. So very quick. Linda says, Mike, the numbers are going up on the home page. Can you? Those numbers on the home page, they imply that they, those are thousands of data points that are analyzed in a very specific formula, and the rating is given from 1 to 6 on that front page. ADDL, that, that um, double ADL is a atmospheric reading from um, lots of different variables, you could say. And what that really is is the atmospheric retention of moisture, right? Because that the atmospheric retention of moisture will also be a almost like a uh, container for radiation uh, which would cause our weather patterns to fluctuate in a deep sense and we are in a very different region of space and there are new energies that we're dealing with how will that affect the physical body well it can for the most part because if you stuck your finger in a wall socket, you'd certainly feel the difference in your body, right? So that means, uh, for those of you who are in electronics, the, the, um, the ability to conduct electricity will change in materials. Germanium is being affected, by the way. It's, it's not as constant as it normally would be. Uh, silicone is still quite stable, but germanium is changing. And there is a offset frequency. Some of you guys may have noticed now, in a lot of circuits, sometimes you can get this resonance frequency of the circuit itself. For some reason, there's some external frequencies that are now beginning to affect common electronics. Right? They're not as, um, they're, it's just not working right. Right? And there, there are certain, uh, you, you guys may be on a cell phone and start picking up radio stations. And that's not supposed to happen unless something has gotten caught in a loop or, or some, of the, some of the properties in your uh, electronics are beginning to change. Things are going wacky. By the way, your brain is very sensitive to radio signals. It, it really is. You're kind of like a big transmitter. And um, 
with all the Wi-Fi that's on the face of the earth. Uh, by the way, if you were trying to nullify the effects of anything, wouldn't you send out a dampening signal, which would be a, uh, a signal of opposite value that would mitigate high frequencies and things of that nature, you would have to send one out. And you'd have to blank the earth with such things, and that's called Wi-Fi. So everything has multiple purposes. Not, not, I'm, I'm not talking about nefarious things either. I'm just speaking of some common things, because the foe uh, that's being faced is actually internal. In fact, we'll get into that another day. I can't really go down that rabbit hole. Let's just say this, that um, what the ancient things that were here a long time ago never left. They're still here, nor do they absolutely die off either. They're still here. They still work. They still influence and, and um, inspire and all sorts of things. So we're still dealing with that, right? Somebody said something about taste. Well, guess what? Zinc is responsible for your taste. If, if you're low in zinc, your taste is, is going to be um, altered. It really will. So then mineral, um, s some sort of increase in minerals or the, let's just say, the, the uh, retention ability of a mineral and its electrons, if that is altered, your taste buds could change. You know, you may chew a piece of gum that tastes like salad dressing, something like that. But it, it's, uh, we have to really consider the spiritual things Jesus spoke about and become those things, right? That is the only ark available is his true salvation. And his true salvation is every single word he spoke of which we can live from, else we die, right? So the world, although confusing to most because how, uh, of how history is taught and and what we are used to and what's common in our lives, although it's very different from that to in some respects, there's still a type of assault that goes on every single day that begins within our minds, within us, the influences that are constantly upon us. We all know that in the Bible, physical changes are going to take place with the human body. Right? There'll be a time when people will forget who their brother or their sister is, which implies something of the magnetosphere is going to be totally out of whack, causing people to, to revert back to a type of survival mentality. Paranoia is going to set in. Everybody's going to think everybody is against them, right? Most of you have, have already discerned a long time ago the feeling of being nervous about something is very different than what it is today. Today it's far more intense, almost to the point where it's totally consuming and over, overwhelming. And most of the Americans, or most people in the world right now, due to... Um, plant life and things of that nature. Uh, your, your body is very adaptive in things, but we've not been getting the right, um, the right elements in the body to mitigate those things. It can be, you know, totally put down spiritually. That's a fact. Even if your body is out of whack spiritually, your body can be put back into order. But that depends upon the condition of your soul. So our first step in the, in, in to be in that arc of safety is to have our souls at rest and that can only happen if your soul abides in Christ and this is what we strive to do in truth not you know even these subjects it shouldn't be some type of entertainment it, it certainly shouldn't be a, a, a game or something traditional that's done it, it is purposed it needs to remain purposed right and we should live by those things that Jesus spoke. Now, by no means should any of this be entertainment for you, something to do to bide your time. And because we've entered into this area, we must now do some things. We must do some things. Do some things. And some of us, even a few people in the chat room, I've been under great duress, and some of you have been under great duress, right? But in all that... Uh, all those things upon us, we still must go forward in truth and do the Lord's work, which is the work. That's called life, by the way. No matter what the point of distress is upon us, Lord knows I've been through it, and going through it is going to get worse, right? It will. And that's not professing something bad. That's just knowing what is. 
Even the Lord said that the times have become worse and worse, right? Love will wax colder and colder. And if it's going to wax cold, I can't go out there expecting everybody to embrace me. Nor should you do the same. But we must walk in the paths of truth and righteousness and let it become part of us and encourage each other to do so. I'm not your critic. I will encourage you. You don't belong to me. You belong to the Father. I belong to the Father. We all belong to the Father. If we do his will, then we'll encourage one another to remain in the Father. Right? But ultimately, we have the final say-so of our own lives and our own choice. Hmm? We do. But I do want to tell you this. The Lord has qualified many of you to do some amazing things. It's time for you to do them. Do you know how many times the Lord has placed something in you, and as soon as you begin to do it, everything else gets in the way? It was designed that way. Let me tell you why. Anything you do for the Lord, if it has no opposition, it's not from him, because everything he does and he sends is tested by fire. So if you do something for him, it must be done in the fire, right? It must be proven. The Lord has given you guys some awesome things. I can never be privileged to have what the Lord has given you. I can encourage you to go forward in that walk of what the Lord has given you, but I can't partake in that. But it must be done in the fire. Those things that oppose you when you desire to do something for the Lord, they are supposed to be there. Anything you do for the Lord will be anyway. Right? Anything not from him will vanish into nothingness. So all things he set forward is, is, is forged in a type of fire. It really is. Shaped and molded with stands and goes forward. There are some folks whose families are ripped to shreds. Husbands, wives, children taken in other countries. Taken by Kim Jong-un, they are in distress. How can they go forward? Hmm? We are so, we're so privileged. We have no idea of the distresses sometimes upon other folks. Imagine if your kids were taken in another country and there's no guarantee you'd see them again. Imagine if you yourselves are taken and there was no hope of getting out. Right? Sometimes we only see our stuff, right? And nobody else matters unless we're comfortable. That should never be. Somebody ought to be thankful today that you still have this day in a type of freedom to do the will of God. Look around your house and just go look in the mirror afterward and say, you know, all this stuff can be gone in a flash. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Because some people are not thankful at all, but we all should be thankful. Horrible storms are forming. It's in the weather patterns. They're coming. Somebody's going to lose their home and their life. And it can't be predicted who. We ought to look around sometimes at what is left and say, thank you, Lord, for your grace given to me that I may find and walk after you. He is the one who's long-suffering to us for it, that none of us perish outside of him. We ought not take it for granted. Don't let anything, listen, refocus yourselves in his work and stop letting things take precedence in your life. What you, what we worry the most for is the very thing that has priority in our lives. I hope it's the will of God. I really hope it's the will of God in somebody else's life. Because there's one thing people haven't figured out. When you truly devote your life for the sake of somebody else, you truly begin to live. There is no other way to live. Most people have that backward. They want to get everything they need to live. No, living is when you die to yourself for the sake of somebody else and then you find life. 
because you find the Lord with you on that path. That's where he is. He is in the servitude he spoke of. That's a hard one to swallow, and it's so simple, isn't it? And we have to be careful. Offenses can ruin, cause one to isolate themselves and walk totally away from the will of God. But Jesus said it must needs be that offenses come. But woe unto him through whom they do come. We really should be thankful. One day, we will not discuss things like this today. But somebody's going to be hungry with no way to gather food. And at that point, only prayer is going to take effect in the leading of the Holy Spirit. Somebody's children are starving and crying right now because they have no food. Somebody's infant is about to die. I'm not trying to crush your day. But we have to be sober. There are many people who have no hope. Now how will they hear the good news? Mm. <laughs> and then we have what everybody fears. That I've become numb to. conflict but this time it'll be on American soil how many people are ready for that you can deny it and we can deny it all day it's coming to American soil there's a process that takes place with every single nation that the Lord spoke of in his word did he bless us yes he did as a whole we did but we spoiled ourselves and now we think we have the answer. Do you know when this country was first formulated? We didn't have the answer. That's why people prayed. You pray when you don't have an answer. You know what they say now? They say, we are going to do this and that. We're full of plans, full of plots, full of everything. We're, we guide ourselves. And then we stand there and say, well, it's, it's the, it, it's, we're doing what's in the best interest of the people. In other words, we're doing what we do for them because they don't know what needs to be done. Those things aren't true either. And it's a perpetual circle. But we who follow Christ should never be in that mindset. But share responsibility over the people by way of prayer and supplication. Because we're spoiled. And we're sealing ourselves in. I'm going to give you an example of one more thing. <clears throat> there are people in people's lives. You know, they get a... We get places where we dwell and get comfortable in our work. And become experts in what we become experts in. Then we begin to seal ourselves in to that place. And what I mean by that is that we secure what we do. Right, And as we secure ourselves and what we do, coming up with routines and things that we do, we get comfortable with it. After so much time and things begin to alter, we complain about the change in our routines that we made ourselves. And we begin to pray for the Lord to restore the routine we made ourselves. Think about that. Well, when we do this, we tend to shut everybody out who does not fit the paradigm of our comfort. Please think about it. If anything disturbs our comfort, we stand against it. So what, what does that imply? We have become a little too comfortable. And we seek comfort every day that we open our eyes. We seek comfort so much that we begin to live for comfort. And that's not life at all. It's just not life at all. And our entire mindset begins to change, which alters the way we communicate and talk. And it begins to alter the sight. And when that happens, a person can really be lost. To be spoiled 
is to be that same thing, is to be that same way. One day we'll all be tested. Because everything that we have in all of our comforts will be disturbed, which is necessary. I ask you this, why is it necessary that everything, that every vessel be shaken? Why is that important? Why is it important for everything to be shaken? Anybody answer that? Hmm? Why? Why must everything be shaken? Well, when it happens, some vessels will break. Some are going to be chipped very badly. Some will leak out everything they have. Right? But guess what? If every vessel is shaken, it does nothing more than expose the truth of that vessel. A vessel that is shaken does not care if it's shaken. If it's intact at the end, which means that vessel had a good foundation in the first place. Right? Imagine a bunch of poles in the ground with lights on the top. That's us, planted throughout the earth. Some of the poles are stuck down 500 feet. Others are stuck down 5 feet. Some of the lights on the poles at the top are not affixed quite right. They all look the same before everything shakes. But the shaking will expose the problems, the errors. Shaking is necessary. And it shouldn't be rebuked. Because if it were not the will of God for us to be shaken, we simply would not be shaken. If it's not the will of God for things to take place in our lives, how can it take place? Hmm? And in fact, how can anything really happen that God is not aware of? And he is a perfect father, so if he's aware of it, he does not ignore it. And if he doesn't ignore it, he knows all about it. And if he knows all about it, then that was not, wasn't that the forethought because he determined the end from the beginning? So then he already planned it all out. We're the ones that don't know why. We ask, oh Lord, why did you do so and so? Can't we see it's for the end? And it's for now. Everything that has happened has happened up until this point for our sakes. Of all of his creation, what is most precious to the Father? You are. Now think about something. You're so precious to the Father that when you were at your worst, you didn't die. Because if you die in your sin, you're done for, correct? If you die in your sin, there's an eternal separation from the Father, correct? And you got all these people out here who are doing everything, but they're not dying in their sins. Why? Because all things are purposed. This is what we have to know. He purposed all things. You know what? The disciples began to speak. They began to know this, and they began to write letters about it. How that all things that happened had to have happened. Certainly when they happened to an individual, they were appointed to the individual. Did the individual call certain things themselves? Yes. And he already knew they would. God knows us better than we know ourselves. But we're the ones making choices. We have a choice. If we, if I do something right now, God knows if I turn left, he knows where I'm going on that left turn. If I go right, he knows where I'm going. If I branch out in any other direction, it's already established. You can only follow a place that has already been established. You can't follow anything that's not established. You yourselves don't establish a new path. You're following a path that has been placed before you. So yes, he knows every single branch of every single path that would ever or could ever exist. He already knows that. But we have to know. We have to finally accept it and say, what? Father, you know what you're doing. Then we get down to business. Like, why did I go through those things? Why did those people come into my life? 
Then we become sober. And you begin to hear the calling of the Father upon you. And his refinement process can be known to you. Mm. Mm. That refinement process can be seen by anyone who is sober. Because repentance always follows sin. And pity is upon the one who does the most devious things. If pity and mercy and grace and great love is not upon an individual, how can they be alive? When they go to suffer, when somebody is even given over to a reprobate mind, guess what happens? Kapoof, they're gone. To be condemned is to die in your sin, but to have life is to be able to make a choice. All that time God gave us to decide. It took some of us many years. Lord knows it took me the greater half of my life to find some of the simple things that were standing right in front of my face. So I could be sober enough to stand up and walk a little bit on my own. But how many people think they know how to walk and end up falling? The one who knows how to walk won't fall. You know why? If you know how to walk, you're not going to walk. You're going to start to follow. Uh-oh. See, if you know how to walk, that doesn't mean you know where you're going. If you know how to walk, but you have no path, you're going to sit down. As soon as you are led, which means you're, being, you're following someone, then you get up and walk because you know how to walk. And then you learn a path. And each step you make, then you know that step. Your life is the same way. Each step you have taken, you have taken that you may know that step. You've stepped off into some thorn bushes on a few times. You know about that step. And because you know about that step, guess what happens? You didn't know this. But as you follow Christ, other folks are going to follow you. And then one day they're going to say, well, who do you follow? I follow Christ. And they're going to walk beside you, not behind you. And you know all the steps. Okay, don't let me ramble. The point here I'm making is this acceptance. Acceptance, full acceptance of God's way upon your life. And in that way upon your life, you have a choice. And in that choice, soberness can be sought. And in that soberness, your eyes open. And when your eyes open, you begin to rejoice. You rejoice. Because you finally see what you've been looking for. And you can never see what you're looking for with your eyes shut. And the only way your eyes are going to be open is first start following. Truly following, not leading, following. When you follow, you accept that the one that you do follow knows where they're going. And if we follow Christ, we have no complaints in our following. But we can ask many questions. Didn't the disciples ask every question? But they asked everything. Like, look, kids, well, why did you say that? What is this for? We ought to do the same thing and do so soberly. Soberly. To be sober is not to be intoxicated with anything. Don't become intoxicated with joy and all these things that people talk about. See, when you're in, listen, when you're full of Christ, you have become what you were to become. If you're intoxicated or saturated or full of other things, how can you become what you are supposed to become? If you're full of something else, that's called drunkenness. Saturated, running over with other stuff, that's called uh, intoxication. Right? Being sober is not to be intoxicated. 
being sober is when you know what you carry. And you'll become intoxicated with nothing. And because you know certain things will intoxicate you, you will never partake of it. See, what may be passive for you may be intoxicating for me. Right? It's kind of like foods. If we sat down at a seafood restaurant and you're allergic to seafood, you don't want your body to absorb what's in the shrimp. But it may not bother me, but you may not want it. So guess what? You better not partake of it. Even though it may seem nothing to everybody else, it doesn't bother them. It bothers you. There are certain things you yourselves can't partake of that another can. Because you have to be sober. Sober. Following Christ is soberness. Now, while everybody's trying to saturate themselves with things in this earth, I found something else out about the new wine. The new wine is not of this earth, but everything else is. I don't want everything else. Therefore, until the new wine is poured again, and I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about in the respects of certain contexts in the Bible either. I'm talking about the new wine that Jesus spoke about. He would not drink with his folks again until he came back. When he's in the kingdom of God, he'll drink the new wine with him again. Nothing earthly, but a new wine. What does wine do? It saturates your blood. It will saturate you. So that type of wine would be what? If it's a new wine, then there's a new type of saturation coming. First, we have this life. But there's another one coming. In this life, we're saturated with so many things, we don't know what we have. Right? When you fully become the new creature, you don't want to partake of things that the old creature partook of. Simple rule that you can use. That can heal a lot of wounds. You ready? Most people will reassociate themselves with things that cause wounds in the first place. Well, that's easy. So long as you're dying to the flesh, don't partake of it. Once you're free of that thing, then it will no longer disturb you. But don't do things associated with the old creature. Put those things away and become sober. It's like an addiction in most cases. There are things associated with your life a long time ago that you used to do in the world that you want to do today and you think it's not going to harm you, but as soon as you do it, it puts you back into this mindset of that old person. Anybody ever do that? I think all of us have. That same harmless thing resurrects things to the old creature, competing with the new creature. You think it harmless. I'm telling you, it resurrects. So if you put those things away, now you're walking forward. Because who can walk forward looking back to the things they used to do? It's almost like a lot of, you, a lot of folks will think in their minds. They'll say, well, I would like to go back in time and just to do that one more time. Yeah, but you forgot about all the bad stuff back in that time. You forgot what was intermingled with it back in that time. Anybody ever do that? You think you had a good moment or a good feeling back in the day. And then as you thought more, you said, oh, no, because I was, uh, what was my mental state back then? I was messed up. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. It would, it would, this was associated with, I want nothing to do with it. That's the conclusion you come up with. Because you tend to, you tend to remember that the, the absolute good part about the past and forget about the bitterness of it. What you really had to go through. Right? So what inspires that? Another spirit. Who puts those thoughts in your head? That is an entity that's targeting something, trying to lure you back. Because even that entity knows that if you do it, you're going to begin to resurrect things of old. Oh, and it comes full circle because old things that were in your life will begin to come back to your door. People you had long forgotten show up.
all an effort to get you back. Why? An entity will only do that to see if you're going forward. Because those who go back, those who go back, never fully had given themselves to going forward. Those who can never go back to the old man have truly gone forward. You can only be lured into something that you want. Therefore, if you cannot be pulled back to the past, you don't want the past, which means something greater is in front of you. If nothing greater is in front of you, you're always going to think about the past. You know what should be in front of us? What should capture all of our attention since we truly believe? It should never be a person. It should never be some type of success or anything else. It should be Christ. It really should be Christ. But here's the key. Are you thinking of Christ with a sober mind? Not for what you can get out of him. Not to have your belly full and all this other stuff, but Christ. Those who look back, right? It just simply means that what was back there is stronger than what's before you. And Christ should be before you always. It's a process. It's all a process. And when you understand it, you can assist people with that process. Because every single last one of us have looked back. We've looked back in those days where we did not believe in Christ. Think about it. When you didn't think Christ could do something for you, what did you do? You looked backward. You looked backward. But what about the person of God? What about Christ? Jesus said to his disciples, you came and found me. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. You came and found me. You were looking for me because I fed your bellies. You were looking for me because you wanted me to feed you again. He told them, follow me to do the will of the Father. I ask you this. Is the will of God stronger than anything in your life? Because if it is, you'll never turn away from Christ. And Jesus spoke the will of God. His words has become a paradise because his words are life his words are the kingdom fulfilled his words are that place many have sought and searched for and imagined and couldn't find and they were there the entire time his word feeds the soul the soul grows and when the soul grows it overwhelms the flesh therefore the flesh becomes a slave to the soul and you won't be a slave to your flesh. To die to your flesh daily is to be fed spiritual food to allow your soul to grow. The Lord said, I would that you prosper as your soul prospers. As your soul prospers, grows, so will you. Your external condition is a reflection of your soul. But all too often we try to fix the outside, not knowing that the inside is damaged. You can heal a person a thousand times who has scars on their flesh. But if their soul has a scar, it's always going to manifest in the flesh. So it does no good fixing the flesh of a soul that's wounded. Fix the soul first with words of Christ by way of full understanding and focus, focus on him and his will. And healing is already yours. You don't have to seek for healing. But seek for your souls to be within Christ. And your flesh and those things that are connected to your life will be healed. What do you think is so agonizing? Because it reminds you that it's broken, but the topical things reflect what's on the inside. Right? If you were walking down the street and all of a sudden you turned purple, what does that imply? And if your skin wasn't purple, it just had this purple hue in it, that means internally something changed, right? When you get pale in the face, internally something has changed. When you're flush in the face, internally something has changed, hasn't it? Right? 
You want a true tan? Change your pigment internally. And you won't have to go out in the sun again to get darker. How about that? So stop looking for a tan and get the soul fixed internally. When it is in its rightful place, being fed the proper food, it won't be sick anymore. Do you know your soul can be sick if it's fed the wrong food? You can get food poisoning of the soul. Listening to garbage doctrine, which are doctrines of men. Your soul is sacred, ladies and gentlemen. And it requires the word of God. It will, it, it's thirsty and it's hungry outside of Christ. It can't grow any other way. It's going to wither with other food. It's going to starve. Feed your soul good food. You have the good food, so feed it to your soul. In other words, begin to live those things you read. Don't, don't, don't worry about anybody else's walk and judgment and all that. You're here to edify, compliment somebody else. But I can't judge you if I'm trying to walk behind Christ myself. Can we not reason together and all follow him together? I have to be right within me. My soul has to be right within me before I can ever judge you of anything. That's why I'm so far away from judgment. Plus, you know how King Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Not to me, there's not. Because I've done everything under the sun. And because I have, I understand the footsteps of another. I've learned what's dangerous, what can kill, what can't kill. Sins unto death. Curses that are eternal. Illusions that we carry. How beautiful and dangerous imagination can be. There's even a type of drunkenness that men can't see. Fully intoxicated. But they're talking like they're sober because it's like watching a drunk person try to be sober. You know what happens when a drunk person tries to be sober? Everybody says the same thing. When you're drunk and you try to be sober, you get sick. The the drunkenness gets worse. When you attempt to be sober, when you're drunk and attempt to be sober, it's like you get twice as drunk and you get sick. Well, you know what happens next? We have to be just sober. There are so many things. And I'm telling you again, though, it's a process in your life. Everything is purposed in your life, or you wouldn't go through it. You can't go through anything that God is unaware of. And you're the apple of his eyes. Your life is purposed all the way to the end. Before that rambling, the two things I answered for Mayor and somebody else. Beatrice, is that it? Uh, Beatrice, Beatrice, and likely some others. Remember what you are. Remember what you are. Your cries were authenticated of the heart unto another. Remember what you are. Walk forward, following Christ. Don't forge your own path. with eyes of soberness do that it's a process and be thankful be very thankful God has been quite gracious to us to humanity period he's coming back again all his word is going to be fulfilled in the earth in our lives. Prior to our Lord and Savior coming back, many things are prophesied to take place. And they will, each one. As they are written, so will they be. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to skedaddle for a minute, but I'll be back in the chat room here shortly, okay?
I'll be here for Dr. V, who starts in about an hour. He starts about an hour. System's queued up. We're waiting on him. Good to see you guys today. Very good. We're going to have a continuation of the workings of what we're doing. I get Angela to check her text messages. That'd be awesome. Folks, I hope it did. I hope the beginning half helped you before I went off hinges talking about, I can't talk about this. When, when, when people start talking about the Nephilim and then you see what's in museums and I get lit up on fire, sometimes it's not good to talk about those subjects you know the most about. Honestly, it's not. Even if I did know the most about it, it's still not safe for me to talk about it because of me, not because of the content. If you get too emotionally moved by something, you're saturated. That's not quite being sober, is it? And I could begin to speak of a, of a very different motive, not soberness. So some areas I can't go into like that. But you should know today that your life is, your life is truly purposed. Right? You had to go through those things. That your heart would cry out for someone else who's going through it. Because you were in that position. And you ask the Lord, just send somebody to me to help me. Well, guess what? He sent you to a reflection of yourself that now resides in somebody else. So do the right thing by the Spirit. Don't do your thing. Do the right thing. Do the wholesome thing. Be led by the Spirit to do the thing in truth. And the Lord heard you the first time. He heard your heart cry out. That's what he hears. We say many words. I suggest to you he hears the heart. We can say anything. But when your heart cries, the Lord does hear. And he heard you the first time. He heard you the first time. God bless you all. And be blessed. Dr. V is going to be up in about an hour. I'll be back in the chat room by then. God bless all.